My name is Connor Wander, and I'm an adrenaline junkie. Hi, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to today's episode of the Straits from a Scientist podcast. We're doing a roundtable on the autonomic nervous system today. That includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, and will range from any topics that involve dopamine, noradrenaline, uh, caffeine, nicotine, and a bunch of other drugs that you might have heard of. We're going to break down... Yeah, perfect. Uh, go for it, Connor. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, good. We're going to break down a lot of the systems uh, that govern kind of everyday life and your existence here and uh, why they're important to think about when you do various activities or eat and, and stuff like that. Yeah, also I was going to say, this is Julian, of course, from Saint, straight from a scientist. Um, I was just going to also add to that, Connor, is that how the battle between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems takes place every day. Yeah, there is kind of a constant struggle for control between the sympathetic versus parasympathetic systems. And if one were to take over completely, um, you might have like a disease state. And that's something that we need to combat with drugs and stuff like that. Now, are there any diseases that where one of these systems takes control or, or hyperactivates? I don't know of any uh, acute diseases. A lot of them are symptoms of... Um, a lot of them are symptoms of other things, right? So in asthma, for example, we have an imbalance uh, in how the bronchia, bronchii are constricted in the lungs. So people have trouble breathing, really. Now, one of the main drugs used in asthma, for example, is albuterol, and that dilates the bronchi, which are the tubes that allow air into your lungs so that you can breathe easier. So in asthma, what can happen is, yeah, there is this imbalance. It's kind of an acute scenario. And there's also like chronic scenarios where uh, like the locus ceruleus, for example, which releases noradrenaline throughout the brain uh, is degenerated like in Alzheimer's. This is a super interesting topic to me, actually, is one, why is the locus ceruleus degenerated? It seems to happen very early in Alzheimer's disease. And two, what are the effects of that? And can we reverse those effects and protect the locus ceruleus or maybe get noradrenaline uh, in another way? So so you're saying that the, in Alzheimer's patients, they have trouble in producing adrenaline naturally? So that's, a, that's something we should clear up right now is that there's noradrenaline and then there's adrenaline. Um, an alternative name, especially if you live in the UK, uh, or somewhere else is uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. So epinephrine. So they're the same thing. Yeah, epinephrine, adrenaline, the same thing. I think technically it is epinephrine now. A lot of people still call it adrenaline, and so do I. Kind of force of habit. The first way I learned it was. Yeah, I was. I've learned it uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. so, so that's interesting. Yeah, you might yeah. think of epinephrine from like an epipen. I don't know if you remember like stabbing <laughs> one of our friends with it. It's a you had diabetic to stab shock. a friend. <laughs> Who did you stab? No, you guys said you did. You stabbed. Uh, I won't. We won't say his name, but um, the diabetic friend oh. and he went into diabetic shock. And epi You're right. the epipen. I so about this. the epipen has epinephrine in it, and it's just systemic release of epinephrine, um, which can cause a lot of changes that allow us to survive. It induces the flight or fight response that lets our body fight for its life. It's you know dire consequences when that is released typically. Uh, but mm -hmm. and it's like this is uh, exactly what happened in the pulp fiction um scene right where she dies or she quote unquote dies from a drug overdose and they right. just stab her in the heart have you seen that movie <laughs> yeah i forgot about that scene okay. actually i was at first i was like what are you talking about yeah <laughs> it's a famous scene yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and a lot of paramedics will carry an epipen on them um, which are famously now extremely expensive and it's really unfortunate because they're used in a lot of scenarios like in allergic reactions, like extreme exactly. allergic reactions, deathly allergic people to uh, peanut butter or, or peanuts or something like that. They Why go is it into always shock. peanuts? <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's, it could be other nuts, but I think, you know, one of the most common nuts around is, is peanuts, but... Yeah, I have no idea. I'm not qualified <laughs> to answer that. You're not an allergy expert. No, I am yeah. not. Hopefully, we um, can have someone on who is an expert on all of these topics. Um, one of my professors I've been talking to, and yeah, hopefully, he comes on. It'll be fun. Cool. So, to break it down, when I first learned about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, they they taught us the simple new new mnemonic: um, sympathetic fight or flight, parasympathetic rest and digest. No, I'm sure you've heard that too, Connor. It's ubiquitous. 
That's right. So these control your response to everyday life and more dire consequences. You're probably shifting towards the flight or fight response. So anytime um, you get scared or startled by something, you're probably sympathetic as your sympathetic nervous system is going to probably take over. Um, if you like get a near miss in a car accident, you're for sure your heart rate is accelerating. If you're just kind of on the couch trying to decide which Netflix documentary to watch, uh, your parasympathetic nervous system is probably taking uh, control and taking care of things. So one of the things that parasympathetic nervous system governs is digestion. It's famous for that. And that's because um, in a resting state or in a state where you're not being scared to death or being chased by a tiger or anything like that, um, you have plenty of time and resources to allocate to, digest to digestion. Now, digestion actually is kind of resource intensive. Um, if you eat a big a meal, you're probably noticed you'll go into a food coma. So like last night I had yeah. a four pound burrito and, um, <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't actually think I was going to finish it at first, but I just kept eating. It was delicious. It was one of those food challenge things. Um, couldn't help myself, I guess. And you won. I did. Yeah. I want a t-shirt. You have to but... send me a picture of that t-shirt. <laughs> I can also send you a before and after picture of the plate. Have a make sure, made sure to record that. But... <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it was delicious. Yeah, so... Now, what what other things affect the sim or parasympathetic nervous system? You talked about eating a huge meal. Um, anything else as far as I, what about body position, laying down versus standing up? Uh, does that does that affect the parasympathetic nervous system? I don't really know. Um, I would imagine. I heard, it, I imagine I'm it does. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I have heard that just by standing up from a laid down um, position, you begin to activate parts of the, the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system, excuse me. Right. So when you're laying down, it would be more parasympathetic control. Exactly. That would make sense. So yeah. Think... Cause you're literally resting. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, another thing that I was uh, extremely interested in is coffee. Mm -hmm. Coffee has a strong effect on the sympathetic nervous system. Is that correct? That is right. Yep. So I actually, the direct effect, we're not exactly sure of why, um, coffee does activate a lot of cellular responses in general. It's coffee's uh, caffeine is the active ingredient in coffee that people normally think of. Now there are other ones that have recently been explored in terms of their antioxidant potential. Um, we might actually want to do a round table on that. That'd be fun because I know we're both, at least I am an avid coffee drinker right now. Are you off the, wow. the stuff? No, I'm, I'm definitely an, uh, off the stuff. <laughs> I'm definitely an avid coffee drinker. We might as well get an IV. Yeah. Especially in the winter time, days are short and I have trouble like waking up early so anyways exactly. <laughs> um, it will elevate heart rate which is a known response of the sympathetic nervous system being activated um, it tends to vasodilate so that's uh, expanding your blood vessels kind of getting you ready for activity a lot of people take caffeine as like a pre-workout before going to the gym and these are the uh -huh. kind of responses that you can expect um, so it's it's interesting people who are habitual coffee drinkers and non habitual seem to have different responses to those things <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so muscle sympathetic nervous activity uh, seem to be a little different between habitual and non-habitual drinkers. Um, and blood pressure was uh, was a little different as well. So anyways, uh, we're getting a little far afield off there. Yeah. Another uh, another drug actually that induces parasympathetic activity is nicotine. So a lot parasympathetic. Of, yep. Parasympathetic. Uh, okay. uh, actually a little of both, but um nicotine directly hits receptors that are involved in directing the parasympathetic response. So nicotine hits nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. There are two types of receptors that govern uh, <clears throat> that govern the parasympathetic response. One of them are muscarinic receptors. Uh, famously hit by muscarin, which I believe is like a hallucinogen of sorts. And then um, mm -hmm. nicotine, which is technically also a hallucinogen, by the way, um, hits the nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors. And that can activate like digestion and stuff like that. So people who smoke a lot um, tend to be kind of dependent on their nicotine to induce uh, bowel movement <laughs> and to, go and to, to be relaxed, you know, exactly. right? And they, to be relaxed. When they're right. stressed out is when they smoke. Now, this is something interesting I've always wondered why um, smokers always smoked after a big meal. And I did a little bit of research on it. And it's exactly what you said also, Connor, but it's also in, induces smooth muscle relaxation. So a smooth muscle are the muscles of your organs and being like, in this case, your stomach. 
So if you have a full stomach and you smoke, it's going to relax the muscles in your stomach and you're, you're going to feel better. I remember actually, uh, I'll be honest, <laughs> a couple of times I ate too much. And one of our old friends, Kevin, um, used to smoke a lot. And I remember I was feeling so bad. I had like a Chipotle burrito or something and I was feeling so bad. And he's like, dude, just take a small uh, hit from this cigarette. And I, I did it and I felt way better instantly. It was it was amazing. So and that that led me to do a little bit of research and to say, why, why did I feel so good? This makes no sense. And that's exactly what it is. It's activating the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, relaxing the smooth muscles in your digestive system. And actually, you, um, yeah. it may actually cause them to contract in some uh, cases. It'll activate peristalsis, which is the peristalsis. movement. Yeah, it's the movement yeah. of food yeah, which, through your intestines. Exactly. So it's actually moving things down the conveyor belt. It's not causing them to relax so much. Um, and in some cases, so the parasympathetic. Yeah, in yeah. some cases, the parasympathetic can actually cause more constriction, like in the bladder. So let's say you're just kind of sitting around, maybe you're studying or something. Uh, you probably have to pee at some point during that, right? Like you're going to notice because you're so relaxed and, and your body's going to tell you, okay, we got to go to the bathroom. Um, if you're running from a tiger, do you think you're going to notice if you have to pee? <laughs> probably not. So it's actually the opposite in a lot of cases um, than, than you would normally think. So smooth muscle, depending on where it is, will react more to constrict based on the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. So, for example, with the bladder, uh, the sympathetic nervous system uh, circulating adrenaline or noradrenaline that hits uh, or directly delivered is directly delivered to the bladder at various p points will cause a relaxation. So you don't feel like you have to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. while you're running from that tiger. And then maybe, you know, you get away from the tiger and you're like, hey, oh, man, I got to go. Now I have now. to pee so bad. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That makes a lot of sense, actually, Connor. You explained that really good. Um, interesting. Yeah, it was uh, from one of my lessons, actually. I'm learning a lot about this stuff. It's really, really neat. So um, learned more about the vagus nerve as well. So I know we mentioned that in our microbiome podcast. And uh, mm -hmm. we, um, I didn't really explain it well because I didn't know much about it. But I had a couple lessons on it. I should have had two full weeks kind of dealing with some of the stuff the vagus nerve does. But UNC got snowed in um, by like five inches of snow, so we didn't oh. have school all week. <laughs> five inches is snowed in? Come on. <laughs> yeah, it shuts everything down down here in North Carolina. We don't have the salt, really, and yeah. piled up. and don't have uh, plows and stuff. One of the, saw a van on campus on a hill just like parked. Trapped. Yeah, it just got yeah. stuck. He was clearly struggling. So anyways, I digress again. <laughs> back to yeah, back to the yeah. vagus nerve. Um, the vagus nerve is huge. Um, mm -hmm. You probably know more about it than I do now after this crazy week of classes. But it's basically, we talked about it before, it's the nerve that innervates the the organs. So that includes all the, the organs in the abdominal region, um, the stomach, and actually including the lungs too, and liver, mm -hmm. and the heart. And the so, heart, that's right. Yeah, and it controls a lot of these major functions. So um, the vagus nerve is actually kind of broken down into you know, various targets and stuff like that. One of the places the vagus nerve hits is the, um, the heart, of course. And uh, beta-1 adrenergic receptors there can trigger increased heart rate. Heart rate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and, and this increase in heart rate is good in a lot of situations, of course, like when you need to run or uh, like when I'm playing paintball, it's one of my favorite things uh, as far as adrenaline goes. Um, but if you have these receptors constantly triggered and you maybe have a chronic level of stress, you have you know a hard job or, or stressful situations, that can be really bad in terms of your overall heart health. So a lot of people who have um, like kind of blood pressure issues uh, go on beta blockers, which block that specific receptor well, not, not so specifically. A lot of drugs have side effects, and that's, that's kind of the problem with a lot of these drugs is they do have side effects. So figuring out how to trigger one receptor in one tissue more specifically is, is really kind of the holy grail of a lot of pharmacology. Yeah, I was going to say we should definitely talk about this, and just we can do a whole thing on drugs. Because mm -hmm. I know when I, one of my pharmacology classes blew my mind when they were talking about the, the periphery versus the blood-brain barrier and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So we can talk about that, but let's not get too deep into it. Absolutely, um, yeah. Interesting. I didn't know about it, but about beta blockers. So, yeah, I heard of people taking beta blockers during super stressful, stressful situations, like um, 
I don't know, uh, public speaking in extreme cases and, mm. and things like that. So they would take them intermittently as a kind of a tool to relax. Yeah, them. I've heard it a couple times of people, you know, that, you know, if they have something and they're really nervous about it, they will take a beta blocker and they will be more relaxed during during the mm. speech or during whatever thing that they're doing, concert or whatever. That's interesting, actually. I didn't realize that. Yeah, you haven't heard of that. Yeah, it's a... It's a prescribed drug for for people with anxiety. Yeah, there are a bunch of like uh, famous ones. I guess I have here. I, the probably the most famous one would be propanolol, um, which is just a an atrial. Uh, uh, it's a node blocker. It's essentially a beta blocker that treats high blood pressure and um, mm -hmm. some of these heart disease conditions. So m maybe people know <clears throat> someone on that. Um, interestingly, though. Uh, some of these drugs do have very different effects depending on which receptor they hit. And, you know, again, that can be a whole, uh, a whole discussion we have in that some of these receptors are specific more for one type of drug or even for one type of uh, neuropeptide or uh, neurotransmitter. So norepinephrine in the alpha adrenergic receptors is just about as potent, potent as epinephrine. However, if you look at the beta-2 receptors like are found in the liver or some of the, um, like the bladder, for example, then epinephrine is much more potent. Now, epinephrine is the one that is only released by your adrenal glands. So that's when you really have an adrenaline spike. Um, mm -hmm. That's when you really get things going is when epinephrine is released by the adrenal glands and that goes into your bloodstream and it hits a lot of places. So in some tissues, it's much, much more potent than norepinephrine, which is typically di released directly from neurons. Mm, interesting, I didn't know that. Now, what kind of, what, how can we explain adrenaline junkies? People that are addicted <laughs> to these, <laughs> this release of, of norepinephrine and epinephrine. I don't know that I know why I'm addicted. <laughs> hey, you're uh, addicted, so you're an adrenaline sure. junkie. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know about yourself, I but that I, a little bit too. Yeah. yeah after I'll... sky, after our skydiving experience, I think <laughs> <laughs> that actually wasn't as big of an adrenaline hit as I thought it would be. I mean, for sure, I was, I was, my heart rate was elevated. I was having a great time. You can't tell me your parasympathetic nervous system <laughs> was activated. Oh yeah, I <laughs> felt like I had to go to the bathroom the whole time. That's for sure, but. <laughs> That's kind of a different uh, scenario. And there are more complicated scenarios in which like people get really scared and then just kind of defecate or whatever. Um, you know, that's kind of a different defense mechanism, which I don't think I'm qualified to explain. <laughs> so hopefully yeah, we get um, someone on to talk about that. It's interesting you say that um, because a lot of fighters, I'm a big uh, MMA fan, and sometimes fighters, when they get knocked out, um, they defecate. This is a, something that happens quite common, more than mm -hmm. you would think. Or so famously. This could be, yeah, if people yeah, this, die, same thing happens. But so this could be something that yeah, exactly what you're saying. Now, without getting off topic, um, I wanted to talk about a couple things that I do when I need to try to hack my autonomic nervous system. <laughs> so, for, for sure. example, um, when I'm tired and lazy, something I love to do, and this is um, coming out of the framework a lot recently, is cold showers. <laughs> it's like the new. Um, I don't know the the golden grail, the new cocaine. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the new cocaine, and it works. I, I challenge all of our listeners: when you're tired or don't want to get out of bed, and you have to, you have a long day, and you're kind of feeling lethargic, try a cold shower, as cold as you can handle, and it it will change your day. It will wipe, it definitely activates the sympathetic nervous system. Absolutely, and it's almost like a double espresso. You know, it, it works excellent. Yeah, it really gets you going. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it is shocking, to say the least. And that's kind of what yeah. triggers your flight or fight response is something that's shocking. It can be, it's somewhat painful for sure. And it makes you think you're about to die, which is uh, that's well, what flight or fun. fight is all about. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is to activate your sympathetic nervous system to release some adrenaline and noradrenaline, noradrenaline. Mm -hmm. and, and the after effects. Kind of, yeah, that's what yeah. we're looking for. And to get your, there's a whole bunch of other things that happen, uh, physiologically speaking in your body, but we're, we're not going to get into that. We can talk about that another day. Mm -hmm. So as I would say, cold showers, yeah. yeah, I would say it's a great uh, replacement for what life might've been like for our ancestors. I know a lot of people have this debate, like how quickly have we evolved? Um, and again, that's another round table. We're just, we're just listing these out, but, um, 
humans have been used to a very dynamic environment and a very shocking, potentially challenging and terrifying environment, right? We haven't always been living in boxes stacked on top of each other. We haven't always just, uh, you know, been, been working in boxes and just kind of talking to each other and sitting on couches and stuff like that. That's not what life was like even 10,000 years ago, potentially. So, um, or not even that long ago, especially when you're talking about genetics and, and developing behavior in a species. So we used to have to hunt all the time. We used to go to war with each other. And, you know, of course, those things are still happening in some places. And we shouldn't hope for these things. But at the same time, we're lacking these semi-regular adrenaline releases that our ancestors probably had in, in almost everyday life. So I think trying to replace that with certain things like cold showers, um, paintballs, uh, like I said earlier, is a huge thing to me. And I only get to go once every few months. So like with video games, that's kind of how I pick that up too. <laughs> what about that jujitsu too? I mean, exactly. any sort of sport I think is a great uh, example of that. For sure. Yeah. And jujitsu is, is great because when you're wrestling, like, um, what's it called grappling with with these people and uh, if they get you into a submission uh state like technically in in a war scenario or a combat scenario they could have killed you at that point so your body really involuntarily uh, activates this flight or fight response there's not a whole lot you can do about that and that's i think good for you as as long as you aren't in a combat scenario that is yeah so you're saying it's probably healthy for us to experience some of this fight or flight, um, but in a in a safe way. I mean, don't mm -hmm. go climbing skyscrapers like those Russian climbers that you've seen all over <laughs> the internet. Never advocate that, or the people who are uh, flight suiting down cliff sides and stuff. So many people are yeah. just dropping from that. It's, uh... But something you yeah, cold showers is great in my opinion, and yeah, sports I think are great. What yeah. about the parasympathetic? Are there any ways to hack in your in your eyes um, to hack the parasympathetic nervous system? Yeah, I was just looking up some stuff. I'm not a huge um, expert on that, certainly, but there are a lot of different things. Like meditation is kind of famous for promoting the rest and digest yeah, response and yeah. reducing chronic stress. I know we've both had experience with that, and um, I think it really is great. And just learning how to meditate alone, like getting yourself good at meditating is a, a really important skill because you can find kind of quiet moments and recognize them and use them to their full potential in your everyday life once you have experience with dealing with your mind in those quiet scenarios. So normally what will happen when you have a quiet moment is you'll be like, oh man, I'm bored. You pick up your phone, you start looking at that and you know, you're tapping exactly. away with your thumbs or something like that. But um, these, these meditative moments uh, that life gives you sometimes when you're waiting for the bus or whatever, can really help you activate the parasympathetic nervous system and turn down the sympathetic uh, system. So chronic activation of sympathetic responses could be part of the issue that some people have with high blood pressure, chronic stress. And um, it's my pet hypothesis that maybe in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the locus ceruleus degenerates quickly and early because of these chronic stress conditions. Maybe mm -hmm. it's being like kind of overused at a basal state. And instead of having that happen, we should appreciate the quiet moments, and then also seek out the very intense moments um, so that you can kind of have a good signal to noise ratio of all of these things. Exactly. Yeah. And even, even if you're not into meditating, slow, deep breathing actually mm -hmm. reduces your heart rate yep. and helps activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So, I mean, meditation, great. It's the same, but even just a couple deep breaths, I think, you know, that's why they, when people are angry, they always say, Take mm -hmm. some deep breaths. It's okay. <laughs> it's the Wim Hof method. Yeah. Yeah, the Wim Hof. Highly recommend people well, look that up. We should put that in the show notes for sure. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention, because uh, it ties into one of our previous roundtables, uh, which we talked about the microbiome. So that's all the you got bacteria and fungi and other organisms that are in your intestines. Um, some people say that balancing the gut microbiome can actually create a positive feedback loop through the vagus nerve, um, which increases its tone. And the vagus nerve can stimulate the locus ceruleus. Um, so if you, oh. have, if you have these systems that are working properly, you should be fine. But if there's a gut imbalance, maybe the vagus nerve isn't sending the right messages to the locus ceruleus. And perhaps that's a reason for degeneration in like an Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease scenario. Yeah, or it could be even just be a blocking of the vagus nerve or right, sending yeah. different... Yeah, exactly. So the vagus nerve is huge. That's interesting that you're doing a lot of uh, research on that right now. Yeah, I'm super interested in that. Absolutely. Um, would love to find someone who 
uh, could come on for an interview and talk about that. So maybe a public service announcement right now is a good time. Uh, <laughs> if anyone knows people who want to come on the podcast, we would love to host interviews with them. Um, would love if you can get us in touch with them. We are, of course, at straightfromascientist.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have Instagram. You can reach us on those platforms um, or just our emails, which are listed up on the, the team page. That's straight from the scientists. Um, would love if you could share it with people who might be interested in coming on for interviews. We're particularly interested in people who are experts in their various fields, and there are so many different fields to choose from. So exactly, talk to we, all we already have. We got a couple of interviews in the frameworks for you guys. Um, one is about nutritional neuroscience, which should be next week coming out. So nice. look forward to that. That should be exciting. And I think Connor, you had one too this week. Uh, yeah, I'm probably setting one up on cell cycle control. Um, I think we're both busy. We have our doctoral written exams due uh, in the beginning of February, so <laughs> we're really trying to crush yeah, out no the hurry. right now. Yeah, we'll try to produce some good content. Cool. Well, yeah, um, we're looking forward to any um, criticism, constructive <laughs> criticism from you guys. Questions, anything, just uh, shoot us an email or contact us on Facebook, Instagram, anything. Um, we we want to hear everything and anything from you guys. And of course, suggestions uh, for future roundtables, or or anything, um, people that you want us to interview. Just yeah, shoot us an email. Technical concerns and stuff like that. We're still learning how to podcast, and um, we of course love your support. We still have a Kickstarter campaign active. It's going to be done February eighth, I believe. So we've got a couple weeks left. We'd really love your support. This can help us get better show notes. Um, make sure that our back end is filled up and we actually refer you to the right sources and make sure that everything's and really streamlined. And buying new microphones. Exactly. Nice. Make sure our, our audio quality, especially in these uh, multi-person roundtables or these interviews, you might notice that the audio quality really isn't up to par and that's because we have, uh, each of us has like one good microphone. So we need to get, we need to get a little Working better on, on that. It. Yeah. Get some more equipment. On the way though. Cool. On the way for sure. On the way. Cool. Well, that's all for today, folks. Thanks for tuning in. I yeah, really appreciate it, all you listeners. Um, thanks for your support and thanks for your reviews, those who have already helped us out. Uh, this uh, podcast will actually be kind of different because I'm going to be breaking out one of our infographics, uh, things I've been working on as I study in these classes. It's kind of like my, my studying technique is I draw all of these pathways out and I organize the information where it's easily accessible for me. Uh, so I've been I've been doing that uh, in a graphic design manner, and I'm going to be posting that in the show notes once it's finished and kind of approved by some of my professors who hopefully we can have on an interview at some point. Cool. Well, excited to see that, Connor. Now I'm probably going to um, get some writing done later and maybe play a game of League of Legends to spike my adrenaline, get my <laughs> get my blood <laughs> pumping. <laughs> Are you perfect. still playing? And then to go to sleep, meditate yeah. a little bit, right? Ooh, perfect. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I'm not going to sleep just yet. It's... It's only four here. I know you're about to go to bed, so you should probably yeah, do some breathing. Time. I need to do some breathing <laughs> and eat a heavy carb meal. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Julian. All right, everyone. Okay. Thanks for listening. Bye.